GTN, China Global Television Network. The African Union is now a permanent member of the G20, and it came quickly and surprisingly after years of unsuccessful attempts. Looking back, it was perhaps the continent's biggest takeaway from the 18th G20 summit meeting in the city of New Delhi in India. So now there is South Africa and the African Union as members of the club. And of course, Nigeria is in the queue waiting after filing for membership as well. But to what end? And more importantly, why was Africa's membership to the G20 fast tracked? I'm Uchechi Okoronkwo. Welcome to Talk Africa. African leaders have hailed this decision of the G20 to admit the African Union as a permanent member. Before we begin our discussion, my colleague Chao Mugono tells us more. The African Union's admission to G20 is a momentous step. Until recently, South Africa was the only African country member. The AU's membership was announced at the recent G20 summit in India. To my great satisfaction, the admission was approved at the opening of this summit. His Excellency Modi, the Prime Minister of India and the members of the G20, endorsed the ascension of the African Union to this major economic decision-making body. Asumani says the AU's entry would provide a greater voice to the Global South within the G20 adding that the African continent now has an opportunity to further its agendas on the global stage. Of course, it will help a lot. Africa has, of course, internal issues. It must find solutions to those issues, but with multilateralism today. We cannot work alone. We have to work with our countries, and therefore, those powerful countries from the G20 can help us in those issues. Collectively, the 55-member African Union has a GDP of 3 trillion US dollars with around 1.4 billion people. Chao Mohono, CGTN. Well, joining me now to discuss that historic inclusion of the African Union into the G20 and certainly the context in which this landmark decision has been made are from Johannesburg, Ron Derby, who is an editor-in-chief of The Mail and a Guardian. And from Lagos, Cheta Nwanze, a political analyst and lead partner at SBM Intelligence. And from London, Charlie Robertson, head of macro strategy at FIM Partners. Welcome, gentlemen, uh, to the program. And let's delve uh, right into this uh, development. Cheta, and I'll start with you. Seven years now, African nations have been uh, trying to get into uh, the G20 bloc. Why do you think the African Union has been admitted, especially now? Oh, thank you for having me, Uche. Um, the admission of African nations at this time is uh, simply on the altar of geopolitics. Um, basically, there's... Um, the world is moving towards multipolarity. Things are changing from, um, we are moving from a world that was undisputedly led by the United States and its rules-based order to one that in which um, you have um, in the US on one side and an emerging partnership of uh, China and Russia on the other. And that partnership a few weeks before had um, opened up the bricks to new members. So admitting the African Union into the G20, which to all intents and purposes is, um, is led or is driven by the um, by the Western Alliance, um, is something that they that makes sense for them. Um, basically, everybody is looking for uh, for allies and um, getting new people on the, at the table is something. Is basically West, what we're seeing is chess pieces being put in position. Hmm. Well, Charlie, I'll ask you. Uh, what is your take on the geopolitical, or, or rather the geopolitics of it all? Because the move will give uh, AU the same status as the EU uh, in the bloc. Is it clear exactly what status Africa will hold? And I think the problem there is that even the EU uh, chief, and, and the EU is, does at least have its own single currency and does have 
uh, you know, its own central bank, many people don't take the head of the EU very seriously. Um, and, and we've seen examples of that in Moscow, where uh, I think Putin was, was ignoring the head of the EU to talk to Germany's chancellor or the French president in a recent meeting a few months ago. Um, and, and that's even more true, I think, of the African Union. Unfortunately, I, I don't know who the head of the African Union is. Um, and I, um, and, but what's worse is that I don't need to know because it's not, it doesn't play a role um, in terms of, of meaningful votes or, or economic policy making that, that actually impacts on markets. And certainly a lot of people uh, will agree with you both. But I want to turn to Ron because until now, South Africa has uh, been the only African nation uh, in the G20 uh, bloc as a G20 member. So give us a sense of how, what role the country did play. Uh, was it meaningful at all uh, in terms of the role it played in the global body? So our discomfort here down south in South Africa has always been the discomfort that South Africa has found itself being the spokesperson for an African economy. So whilst I agree with both my panelists that the AU as a body is not that important, I, and I, I guarantee they'll be pro probably ignored when it comes to meetings around this, around G20, it's just about getting a voice outside of South Africa. It was clearly, even in, in the growth of the African economy, South Africa is, has been underperforming how many, 10 odd years. So this is a chance for, and I think our president really pushed for this, but it has been a certain sense of uh, discomfort even in local circles that we're the only one in this body of G20. And as, as, as I said, the shifting geopolitics now, we're able to kind of find a new ally and it has opened up the space for a broader conversation with the AU. But I, I do think individual countries are more important than the AU. Uh, so in Nigeria, we have Nigeria on this call, joining the G20, probably a bigger story in, in of itself because AU will be ignored pretty much like the EU is. But I, I do think within this grouping, just having South Africa, there was always a very weird thing for all of us in, in South Africa as well. And Chad, I just I want jump. to quickly ask you what your take is and what Ron just said in terms of Nigeria uh, wanting to join the bloc. Uh, do you think uh, Nigeria has a good chance? Uh, what what does Nigeria have to offer? Well, um, not much, um, sadly, and um, same as South Africa. Um, if we were to look at it on a country by country basis, there are only 19 members in the group. Um, the, e, the G20 was formed, um, what was it, in 1999, based on um, the leading economies at the time. Um, and South Africa at that time was without doubt um, one of the top 20 economies in the world. Unfortunately, 20, uh, 24 years later, and things have changed significantly. Um, Nigeria is now the largest economy in Africa. Egypt is the second. South Africa is the third. Not, no African country in its own right um, should be in the G20 if we look at it based on the reason that the, GD, uh, the G20 was formed. Um, this was um, in response to the debt crisis of the late 1990s. Um, the truth is that African economies have not have punched well below what they should be able to. And um, as an African living in Africa, um, what I would be more concerned with is also um, getting the African Continental Free Trade Agreement off the ground. Because it's that internal trade that will actually enable us to grow properly. Well, I want to delve. Uh, go uh, ahead, Charlie. Go so ahead. there's a couple of things. Firstly, I just to, to back up Ron's point. If I was at the African Union now, my big priority would be trying to build trade links to the to the ASEAN countries. If I had a, if I had a big geopolitical priority, mm. I'd want to be doing a free trade area with the, some of the fastest growing economies in the world. And Fin Partners does a lot of work in those countries because they're doing so well. Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia. These are these are boom stories and. Right build trade links with those guys, looking to a future of, of kind of with, with regards to minerals or electric vehicles, all of this. Mm. That, that's what I would be prioritizing. More beneficial for Africa. But I want to delve further into something that all of you have talked about, which is the fact that the AU membership is more about geopolitical, geopolitical tensions uh, right now. And we heard President Modi saying uh, that this uh, move was to transform the global trust deficit right now into one of trust and reliance. What are your thoughts on that, uh, Charlie? Some believe the AU's membership, of course, is driven by these tensions. Do you agree? Is this just a symptom uh, of all that's going on right now? Uh, I totally agree with what Chetta said at the beginning. This is this is geopolitically led. We're going to a multipolar world. I, I agree. Um, I, in terms of the trusts and so on, I, I, it's another talking shop. And even the UN 
you know, a lot of these leaders are going to go from this and they're going to head off to the to the United Nations and there'll be yet more talking. I don't know what the, they're mostly doing. The one thing that I am seeing the G20 talking about where there's a relevance to the continent is on the, the debt issue. That That is a problem, not just in Africa, but also countries like Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Laos. Uh, there's There's this issue of what can the G20, and that is often the, the wealthier countries, what can they do to try and ease the debt burden? Um, mm. That's been something that Modi has prioritized when he, he's with the presidency of the G20. And, and, and in that regard, again, it, it probably helps to have an African Union representative around the table. I don't think yeah. it'll make much difference, but it helps. <laughs> and, and, and we'll get into uh, that a bit later. But Ron, I want to ask you, do you think this is also an effort to minimize or scuttle uh, the influence that BRICS uh, was starting to build? I think it's uh, to balance it out. I think uh, Modi was here in South Africa a couple of weeks ago, and he was uh, signing up for the BRICS and expansion of BRICS. But I think I, I had a chance to, to be around his people. They're kind of worried. I think India is stuck in, in, in a place where they are not as, they're not in the position of a China, right? Where China and the US clearly are on a, on a collision course. And so India sits itself there, still being brought in, being, I don't know, being cushioned and, and played with the West. So still have friends in the West and pretty much still want to play in, in this BRICS uh, backyard. So for India, and I, and I get the push is, let, let's bring Africa into G20. So it's almost to benefit the West. So the West has some sort of, I don't know, is it a, is a PR as a, a window into Africa? Was it, as, as Charles Charlie said, the growth is going to come from a, a Asian countries, right? Uh, that's where growth will come from as a young populist. So this is a potential. So that's where we should all kind of look towards if we're looking for for Africa to grow grow itself out of a position it's in. And that's, yeah, that's where we all should be focusing our energies on. Benefits from G20 are the Western nations, right? We're getting AU into there and suddenly, so they talk, uh, the African story is, changes somewhat when it comes to G20, which, which has largely been dismissive of African economies and countries over the 20, 20 odd years since its formation. Well, I want to continue uh, on a more positive note, uh, as you started there, uh, Ron, uh, because as you've all alluded to, the AU's entry into the G20 could help uh, do certain things like diversify its glo Africa's global alliances, also open new avenues uh, for cooperation. So, Cheta, what opportunities do you see specifically that could actually help transform the status quo geopolitically with the AU and AU's entrance into the G20? I'm sorry to sound so uh, to sound um, a bit negative, but I don't see anything. And let me mm. tell you why. Um, the African Union, as we've established, is um, is weak economically, is weak geopolitically, and um, it doesn't really speak with one voice. Um, the African Union is an amalgam of, depending on who, of 54, 55 countries, depending on who you speak with, and each of them have their own interests. I mean. Look at what is happening, for example, with the coup belt in the Sahel or in Central Africa. There are different ways of looking at things. And I kind of get um, a bit worried about this whole idea of looking at Africa as a block. This is a diverse continent, the second largest continent in the world. Um, I would be a lot happier if we have, for example, the ECOWAS, the SADC, the East African community trying to move their things. because geopolitically and um, in the emerging world geopolitics will drive a lot of things geopolitically we have different interests so for example people on on the eastern seaboard of africa in the rift valley they have closer historical links with with asia they must do stuff with asia those of us on the west coast we will have to do stuff with asia yes it's inevitable but we also have links with uh, based on geography, just geography alone, we're on the same, we're, we have links with Europe. So we must explore those. Um, so just expecting the whole of Africa to move as a block um, doesn't quite sit well with me. On the, on the other hand, I, I, like I said earlier, I think that we need to get the African Continental Free Trade Agreement up and running in reality. Because mm. once we be, we can begin to trade properly within one another and integrate properly, then we will be able to present a stronger unified case. Right now, there isn't any. There just isn't any. 
Well, gentlemen, we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, we'll try to answer the question, can the African Union leverage this G20 membership in order to push for the reform of global structures and systems that, of course, have played a role in economically marginalizing the continent? <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Africa. Still with me are Ron Derby, Cheta Nwanze, and Charlie Robertson. Now, of course, uh, before the break, uh, we were discussing quite a number of things. We looked at the significance and the context of the African Union's inclusion uh, into the G20 bloc. But let's now examine whether Africa can push for change, for reforms from within, uh, also uh, looking at a global system designate, designed rather to marginalize uh, the African African continent. And Charlie, let me start with you because African nations, uh, they have been advocating for reform, uh, especially in the international financial architecture, uh, reform that includes fair treatment uh, by financial institutions, debt relief uh, possibly. Uh, what is your take on whether we're likely to see the G20 members uh, working with Africa to change that? I, I mean, I think most of the change that we should expect on the global financial architecture is really a big argument going on between the US and China um, as to whether China, which since delivering universal adult literacy, since getting massive domestic savings has taken off and become second biggest economy in the world, but that is not recognized in its voting weights in the IMF. Uh, it's not recognized at the World Bank either. Um, and as a result, we've seen then China say, right, well, we'll set up our own bank, the New Development Bank or the AIB, AIIB um, mm -hmm. for, for Asian infrastructure. Um, so I think that's the big, the big debate. I don't think changes in the international financial architecture are going to give particularly bigger weights to, to African economies without the justification that China's got for it, which is that China's massive. Mm -hmm. um, but what we are likely to see is continuing discussion well and it's already gone on for two or three years continuing discussion about how to manage the debt loads that have been built up over the last 20 years um and and the g20 is going to play a role in that because of germany and france and the uk and the us being the key power brokers in the g20 um and but but china's in that forum too so it's one of the one of the places that actually everyone can get around the same table. Mm, mm. Well, Chad, what's your take uh, on what Charlie said? Uh, do you think we're going to see continued uh, discussions? And I want to talk specifically uh, on an issue such as the delivery of that long promised $100 billion a year from wealthier nations in climate financing for developing nations. Uh, also on issues such as the global tax on fossil fuels. Do you think we'll see continued conversations or will we will we see this g20 membership sparing progress i i think that we'll see continued conversations i i'm not very sure that we'll see progress um because it's not again again the geopolitics will, will get in the way um it's for example in terms of uh, climate change uh, climate climate change all sounds good on paper but there's an energy crisis in Europe at the moment so climate change is going to take a back seat that's mm -hmm. the that's the brutal truth African countries need to industrialize and um, they can't do that without a lot of energy um, so those conversations will continue to happen because a lot of Africans are going to start pointing out what they see as the hypocrisy of um, of the larger nations. Um, the the two biggest emitters are, are the U.S. and China. Um, India is on the is, is on the fast track to join them. Europe still does its own emissions, and um, unfortunately, because of the uh, conflicts in Russia and Ukraine, um, more and more Europeans are going back to dirty fuels in order to stave off energy um, the um, rising energy costs. So these issues will remain on the front burner um 
I don't see too much action. And unfortunately, because of the manner a lot of African countries have handled past debts, um, the appetite to just keep giving them money, keep giving them loans, is not quite there. I don't see a lot of that appetite just coming out of the out of the blue. Mm. So, um, at the end of the day, a lot of naked interest will, as for example, the Black Sea Green Initiative showed, a lot of naked interest will, will trump what people um, talk about. Um, it's not about what they say, but it's about what they do ultimately. Mm. And what's your take on that, Ron? Now that South Africa has uh, uh, voices joining it at the G20, what are your views on what should be Africa's priorities and what really is going to happen? As uh, my colleague said, the Africa Free Trade Agreement, right? We all know that is the key to unlocking us all. But I, I was thinking about this element uh, with, okay, South Africa now finally joined by AU as a voice there, but I, which goes back to the earlier point about the EU. No one really uh, cares what the EU does in the G20. Similarly, I, I mean, is EU every six months? Is it every six months is a new president? So I can imagine that every next G G20 meeting, someone else at the table, right? So, so, and so. In, in, in what I was saying earlier on about our competing interests on the continent, if you have every year a new country, it was an East African country, a West African country, a South, Southern African country uh, leading AU, you're going to have different uh, yeah, di different stories being forced to the table. So maybe there is room for the AU to, let's focus on the reform within the AU. Maybe that's a, a, a question in point. When, when Paul Gahame uh, was heading up AU, he had lots of interesting things to say about the continent as a whole. And he didn't I'm not a champion of him at all, but he did not speak as Rwanda alone. And he actually, and he actually has some salient points about where the continent is in, in terms of the global stage, but he's gone within a year. And so whoever else comes in, is, so it's all, so, the, so almost Africa's story is dependent on who's ahead of EU. So maybe there's reforms there to be had, similarly what the EU should do there, maybe a three year, a four year term. But those are the sort of things that, look, you are in the party. Admittedly, AU is in, within that party, AU is a very small, a, a, a small player within it but the fact is for the past 20 24 years there hasn't been any room for that conversation and i think yeah. the fear of this world of moving towards china us and where everyone else lies in that in that battle we are on the stage and, and as the our economies graduate graduate and the the they grow they're going to be more a significant player but we've got to make sure au is fit for purpose for it well, I'd like to get uh, all of your takes. Uh, in an increasingly fractured and multipolar world order, what value then do you hope uh, to see the Africa Union bring uh, to the discourse at the G20? Charlie, I'll start with you. I, I'd be very surprised, um, but I, I'd say that about the G20. Um, and I was kind of thinking, what would happen if we didn't have the G20? Who would, who would notice? What's it done? ever that that is actually meaningful um and um, i recall the one thing I, I do know and it's the only thing I, I can think of that they've done which is back in 2009 there was a g20 meeting where there was a big they helped agree on this big distribution of imf cash uh through the special drawing rights um it's not strictly speaking imf cash but cash the imf sdrs mm. um and it helped bring the, the, the world economy out of the global financial crisis. But what I heard afterwards is that wasn't a G20 decision. And that some countries, and I've spoken to officials from other countries in the G20, they said they had nothing to do with this. They, they didn't even have a policy on this issue. They didn't know what to say. And these were mm. well-established countries that had been around for hundreds of years, and they didn't have anything to bring to that discussion. It was led by Germany, UK, and US. And, and I, so I think the idea that the African Union, with the lack of capacity that many local gov and governments across the continent have to, to have joined up policy even on economic issues within a country, what are the odds that we're going to get an African Union of over 50 countries coming up with a unified policy stance? Mm. I mean, it's, it's, I can't see a coherent voice coming from the African Union. And that's, uh, but I'm not particularly criticizing the AU about that because even governments when the, when the g20 did do the one thing it's ever done you know most governments didn't play a role at that discussion around mm. the table mm. and what's your take ron are you hopeful at all that the au can bring some little value uh, at the g20 it's hard to find but i'm going to push ahead and find something that i i think as a champion of multilateralism 
as the continent, when the continent is exposed to east and west. And it's the one continent that uh, I think we can't go and decide, okay, we, we, let's, let's put our, all our lots with the east, and neither can we do with the west. So as that anchor, we kind of need both uh, sides of the world, the east and west divide to, to trade with and to, to grow ourselves out of it. So it's another voice in that push, and I guess all of us here would want a world like that, right? Where we don't go back, slip back into the old, uh, the end of the 20th century. So as that, yeah, as that symb symb symbolic, <laughs> symbolic uh, member of the G20 and just if you go to any president on the continent and talk about the fact that trade needs to grow between inter-African inter trade needs to grow they'll all say yeah we've all signed up for it we just don't know how I mean, the Africa Free Trade Agreement is mm. the hope and we hope that works into fruition uh, but it, I almost say in nature Africa has to sit for multilateralism we can't we can't swing on either one of, the, of those two spectrums so that's I guess symbolically that's what what the AU can do in there and talk. I mean, I know South Africa in particular because we the bottom of the continent. We have the Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean. Simply can't be aligned to anyone and their dogs. So we, uh, uh, Ramaphosa and presidents before, have all gone in there and just on, on the basis of like, hey man, everyone's our friend. We all need to find a way to grow. So I guess symbolically, the AU being there is just that's the champion for that mountain lateralism in a world that, as we all know, here has become rather bipolar and rather rather scary rather scary backyard so mm -hmm. that's symbolic that's the au for now but i do think you know if i'm an optimist about the continent in 10 20 years and what 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 may come if the right policy choices are made yeah so it's a uh, that's my only positive from it. but i i agree right now as in today yeah it's just really symbolic and won't do much uh given the strength of symbolic the and what's your take, Chetta? I mean, there's been some talk about this admission into the G20 uh, uh, as also a sign that Africa is now being realized as a global power. Are you hopeful in any way uh, that this could bring some change? I think in the course of this conversation, we've established that, um, the, that the admission into the G20 is largely symbolic. Um, I think that um, one of the things that we need to learn how to do as a people um, is to um probably whatever advantages we may have or to look for advantages in whatever situations may exist even if cynically so as an example one of the things that europe is uh, re really frightened of right now is uh, migrants um migrants coming from africa we could actually and it's a it's a very cynical take but we could actually use that um to get more development assistance and more trade i, I would prefer trade rather than aid um, more trade, which would enable us to begin to to begin to grow. Um, now, that's that's just me. Um, but aside from that, in the immediate, I don't see any value that we that we truly add. Um, I'm going to take something that Ron said. Yes, there's there's a, there's room for optimism for the future, but provided we make the right policy choices and follow through. It's very important. Um, there, there are so many African countries which make good policy um, announcements, good policy statements, but then follow through is lacking. And that has been one of the problems of the continent over the last 50, 60 years. Follow through. When a new government comes, they reverse everything, and you just basically have to start again. It doesn't help to build the confidence that is necessary for long-term growth. That is something that has to change. Well, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for that insightful uh, conversation. And that's where we'll leave it on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our guests, of course, Ron Derby, Editor-in-Chief of the Mail and Guardian, Cheta Nwanze, a political analyst and lead partner at SBM Intelligence, and, of course, Charlie Robertson, Head of Macro Strategy at FIM Partners. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation online through our social media handles on Facebook and, of course, the platform formerly known as Twitter X. You can also watch the show on our YouTube playlist. Do keep the conversation going and join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Uchechi Okoronkwo, and the team here in Nairobi, until next time, it's a goodbye.